To all of you who have come to this happy place, welcome. Ever since I was a child and I was stepped through the gates of the Magic Kingdom, there was always one place I wanted to be above all. On board a pirate ship, soaring over the city of London while I prepared to fly into Neverland. To me, at Disney, there's no better adventure than the one we can find in Peter Pan's flight. Whenever I was a kid and I would go, come out of the ride, I would always be ecstatic at seeing Peter Pan defeat Captain Hook, and I would always ask my parents if I could go back inside the line to experience all that magic once again. But if I would have been a park guest back in 1955, when the park first opened, I would have come out of the same ride filled with no emotion other than disappointment. The engineers at Disneyland, or Imagineers as Walt Disney called them, were very excited to show the world the work that was done in Peter Pan's flight. You see, at the time they used a revolutionary design of an overhead conveyor system that would suspend the right cart from the ceiling instead of the ground to give a true sensation of flight. This revolutionary design was one of the many reasons why the Imagineers were very excited to hear what park guests thought of this very special attraction. But to the Imagineers' surprise, when the park opened and the park guests came out of the ride, they came out doing nothing but complaining. Park guests would go into Peter Pan's flight expecting to see the beloved Peter Pan, only to find out that he wasn't even in the ride. Park guests would think that they actually missed him, would go back inside the line thinking that they would have to find the hidden Peter Pan, but the result was always the same, disappointment. You see, leaving out Peter Pan from his own attraction wasn't an oversight, it was actually done on purpose. The Imagineers wanted park guests that as they went into the ride and looked at each of the most iconic scenes in the Peter Pan film, that they would be doing this from Peter Pan's perspective. But sadly, this message wasn't communicated well and it wasn't received by the audience. And it took the Imagineers five years and many complaints later until they realized that they had to make a change. A projection of Peter Pan was added. So when park guests began to take flight, park guest shadows would turn into Peter Pan's. Now, once this change was made, Park guests would go through the ride amazed at both the creativity and experience of seeing everything from Peter Pan's perspective. Now, like in every Disney movie, there's always a lesson to be learned. The Imagineers learn the importance of communication for something as grand as an organization like Disney and as small as Peter Pan's flight. It doesn't matter if you have the most powerful values or ideas, if what you're communicating isn't received by your audience, the message does not exist. We have all been in that place where we say something to a friend or a loved one and we hurt the other side. Not because of what we say, but how it was received. Our first instinct is often to say, that's not what I meant. What the Peter Pan story highlights is that it's not our words that have power, but the power lies in how our words are received. It took the Imagineers five years to learn this lesson, but once they did, they showed an understanding and communication that they didn't have prior. They didn't just keep asking themselves why nobody understood this message. They saw that what they were trying to communicate wasn't being said properly and they had to make a change. Peter Pan's story highlights that we not only need to be respectful of how our messages come across to whomever we're trying to speak with, but that we can understand that if what we're trying to communicate is not received by our audience, we need to stop saying that's not what I meant and make the same adjustments that the Imagineers did when they added Peter Pan to Peter Pan's flight. The world of Disney has always played a key part in my growth, no matter what stage of my life I have been on. From the very beginning, growing up in Costa Rica, Disney films were the only movies I would watch in English, which quickly helped me learn the language from a very young age. Growing up, regardless of the fights I would have with my sister, we would always be able to bond over a love for movies like Lil and Stitch. But now as an adult, Disney has taught me three lessons in the power of great communication that I want to share with you all today. We always hear that communication is what makes or breaks the teams we work in every single day. But Disney teaches that it's not just an idea of communicating, but having the right kind and the right environment to do so. Because of this, our journey today began with an absent Peter Pan, but will soon continue with a 14-year-old boss and with, will end in an exiled monster in the Himalayas. So I hope you buckle up, remain seated with your hands, arms, feet inside the vehicle, while we visit different Disneyland attractions and we learn the magical lessons of Disney's communication. We just came out of Peter Pan's ride and now it is time to leave the land of fantasy and go into the world of tomorrow. In Tomorrowland, we can find fan favorite attractions like Space Mounted or Buzz Lightyear Space Ranger Spin. But to me, the most impressive and immersive experience lies within Star Wars' very own Star Tours, where we can travel to distant planets like Hoth and Tatooine. 
Whenever I'm in the line for this very special attraction, I always look at R2-D2 jumping out of the spaceship that we're about to embark on, and I can't help but laugh at how this whole ride came to be. Now, if I told you that when Star Tours was pitched and put into production, that it was done by a 14-year-old kid, would you believe me? Well, Michael Eisner, the CEO of the company at the time, brought his 14-year-old son into Imagineering meetings and used him as a prime decision maker to accept or reject any proposed plans from Imagineering to put a new attraction into Disneyland. Now, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't like a 14-year-old kid randomly becoming my boss one day. When Imagineering calls this story, they remember how frustrating and crazy it was that their next move would be decided by a 14-year-old kid. But it took them a while until they realized that they themselves see each other as kids in a playground designing the next big thing for Disney. Thus, the implementation of this kid into Imagineering was just the embodiment of having someone that would think and listen to just like them, but would be able to communicate with the CEO of the company in a far better degree than anyone in the team could. Now, I see a 14-year-old kid as someone who's typically rebellious and is never afraid to speak their mind. They're never the ones to simply agree with everything their parents say just for the sake of pleasing them. And what is interesting about the role that this 14-year-old kid played at Imagineering and the relationship he had with his father is that it mirrored a very similar relationship that Michael Eisner had with the president of the Walt Disney Company, Frank Wells. To Eisner, Frank was a perfect partner because he acted and had a much different inner child than what we're typically used to. Frank kept the part of an inner child that would never agree with someone for the sake of pleasing them. He was never afraid to go against Michael, the CEO of the company, and would always call him out if he ever did something that didn't sit well with him. It would have been incredible for this dynamic duo to continue at the Walt Disney Company. But sadly, right around the midpoint of Michael Eisner's Disney career, Frank Wells died. When he died, Michael lost the most influential person that was constantly making sure he knew of his mistakes and how to improve them. Whether it was the impact of losing such a beloved friend or the loss of such a great leader, from that moment on, Michael's leadership changed forever. He unintentionally began building teams of people who were unable to disagree with him and who were unwilling to be honest when he was doing something wrong with the company. Whether it was Michael Eisner's new micromanagement style or having a bunch of yes men in his team or even his constant fear that someone was trying to take over his job, Michael began making way too many mistakes and had no one inside that he trusted to be able to call him out like Frank Wells once did. Whether it was Michael Eisner's new micromanager style or having a bunch of yes men in his team or even his constant fear that someone was trying to take over his job, Michael Eisner began making way too many mistakes and had no one inside that would call him out and be able to steer him in the right direction. Unfortunately, mistake after mistake, after 20 long years of service to the Walt Disney Company, Michael Eisner got kicked out. Michael Eisner achieved incredible things at his time at Disney. I will always remember him for how he positively changed the company. If it wasn't for him, Disney wouldn't be the company that it is today. But his legacy will always be tainted by his failure in his second half of his Disney career to hire people who were willing to speak up like Frank Wells once did. The origin story of Star Tours is a reminder to all of the need to keep our own inner child alive. The part of an inner child who understands the responsibility to communicate with whatever personal or professional relationship we have. Relationships that can't disagree with one another do not go far. This was proven to us by Michael Eisner at his time at Disney. We need people and teams that are willing to always speak up whenever they see something wrong. It can be something as small as telling your teammates you're not feeling well one day, or even talking about a, a team member that you feel has disrespected you. It could even be your best friend that said or did something that ended up hurting your feelings. You cannot expect that the other side knows what you're going through or even understands how you feel about their decisions. We can't expect that the people closest to us can read our minds and have an understanding as to how their actions make us feel. What we need to do is remember how starters came to be and always keep that inner child alive like Frank Wells once did when he was a team member that always understood the responsibility that he had to communicate. After our visit to the icy planet of Hoth, on board Star Tours, I'm always in the mood for an icy treat of my own, from none other than the adorable snowman, Frosted Treat Shack. Here, we can find the famous yellow snow cones offered to Mike and Sully when they were stuck in the Himalayas in the movie's Monsters, Inc. But what is more refreshing than the snow cones we're about to eat is the story behind one of my favorite characters in the whole of Monsters, Inc. universe, the Abominable Snowman. When we first meet him, we learn that he was also banished into the Himalayas, just like Mike and Sully were. But 
The rumors of this character is that he went crazy and did terrible things leading to his banishment. But to Mike and Sully's surprise, they find a character that is not only kind, but doesn't understand why he's labeled the abominable snowman. He says, do I look abominable to you? Why can't they call me the agreeable snowman or the adorable snowman for crying out loud? I'm a nice guy, snow cones. I see a character that has down himself by the way that others have cast him out. He's unsure of himself and it is directly due to the fact that he was unrightfully banished to the Himalayas and is seen as this black sheep. He has so much self-doubt that he doesn't even attempt to escape the horrible place that he's in. I could stop right here and tell you that the moral of the story is to never cast anyone out, to always be open to listening to people because someone that is seen as the abominable snowman could really be the adorable one inside. But the lessons that this character teach are far deeper than this. Now, an interesting fact about the abominable snowman is that the voice actor that plays him also voices P.T. Flea from Bugs, Mac from Cars, Ham from Toy Story, and about 12 other characters throughout Pixar films. They're all voiced by John Ratzenberger. Now, after playing in 22 consecutive Pixar films, John became known as Pixar's lucky charm. But the question at hand is why did he keep on coming back to play these characters? It's not like John from the very first Toy Story, uh, Pixar management was like, let's hire this guy and have him play a character in the next 20 years of our films. In interviews, John talks about how Pixar was the only place that he felt he could come in with the craziest and funniest ideas and he would always feel like he was being listened to. He talks about how in essence, all Pixar movies are crazy and are really movies that you wouldn't be able to pitch to any other studio because no other studio would be willing to listen like Pixar does. When imitating someone, pitching the movie up, he says, listen, I have an idea for a movie about an 80 year old guy who attaches balloons to his house and floats away to Argentina with a Korean Cub Scout. Any other studio would call security. John would keep on coming back to Pixar because he saw it to be a place that anyone's craziest ideas was anyone's best. In any company, in any place of collaboration, what is most important is that you first find yourself in a place that you feel like you can speak your mind candidly, but feel that what you communicate is also listened to and heard as well. I always hear companies talking about how important it is to have diversity in your teams. But what Pixar highlights is that we can have a room full of the most diverse thinkers, but you have nothing if they don't listen to one another. Pixar's lucky charm isn't just John Ratzenberger. Pixar's lucky charm is their culture of consistently creating a safe space where we can communicate and share our ideas. We wouldn't have movies about how cars run the world or how toys are animated beings or even how a rat can become the best chef in the world if we didn't have a place like Pixar that focuses so much on creating environments that make us feel like we're listened to. In any relationship we find ourselves in, it's important to remember to carry our own Pixar lucky charm. A charm that reminds us that if we can all listen to one another and our different perspectives, that we will all be able to keep on moving forward, reaching closer to our wildest dreams together as a team. Our day is almost over and we need to hurry up before the fireworks goes off. As I stand right in front of the Disneyland castle in anticipation of the show, I am reminded of everything that Disney has given me. As a kid, Disney has let me fly into Neverland, reach the island of Tortuga to meet Captain Jack Sparrow, or even let me enter the Twilight Zone in a fallen elevator. But as the fireworks begin to explode, I am reminded of everything that Disney has taught me today. In our lives, we we'll all find ourselves in relationships, teams, or even organizations that we feel do not understand us. We might even sometimes be the team member that makes someone else feels like the abominable snowman. But through an understanding of the three stories I have just told you, we can ensure to never see abominable teams and only see the adorable ones. By understanding the power of how messages are received and changed, by creating the responsibility to speak up, and by embracing a culture that creates a safe space to communicate, we will all be able to stand around our teammates and our closest friends, looking at the fireworks, reminiscing on all the magical work we have done. Thank you.